Okay, well, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Amrita Jayanthi. Um, I direct the Tech and Public Purpose Project, also referred to as TAP, here at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. TAP was founded in 2018 by former US Secretary of Defense Ash Carter to work to ensure that emerging technologies are developed and managed in ways that serve the overall public good. We have a very exciting session today, the first in a new public event series titled Finding Solutions, in which we host practitioners across the public and private sectors, many of whom will be our very own fellows, to dive into a myriad of potential solutions to address unintended consequences of emerging technology. We're planning to talk honestly about about problem definition, solutions, feasibility, and intentionality of impact across various solution types. So I'd like to quickly take a moment and thank Karen Ejiofor, TAP's project manager for all her work in ideating and planning this series. To follow the series as well as other TAP events and publications, we encourage you to follow us on Twitter at TAP underscore project and sign up for a newsletter on our webpage. And with that, let's kick things off for today. So we're hosting two awesome TAP non-res fellows, Karen Howe and Joaquin uh, Quinonero Candela. Sorry, Joaquin, if I, if I messed that up, but um, I'll give them a brief introduction and pass it over to them for a fireside chat style conversation for the first 40 minutes. Uh, we'll save some time at the end for audience Q&A. So please use the Q&A feature in Zoom, not the chat box, but the Q&A feature uh, to submit any questions you may have for Karen and Joaquin. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce them. And if you all wanna pop into the uh, screen, you can do that now. So Karen is the senior AI editor at MIT Tech Review, covering the field's cutting edge research and it, its impacts on society. She writes a weekly newsletter called The Algorithm, which was named one of the best newsletters on the internet in 2018 by the Weeby Awards and co-produces the podcast In Machines We Trust, which won a 2020 front page award. In March 2021, she published a nine-month investigation into Facebook's responsible AI efforts and the company's failure to prioritize studying and mitigating the way its algorithms amplify misinformation and extremism. Her findings were, cited, uh, were cited in a congressional hearing on misinformation two weeks later. In December of 2020, she also published a piece that shed light into Google's dismissal of its ethical AI co-lead, Timnit Jebru, which congressional members later cited in a um, in a massive a missive to the company. Prior to MIT Tech Review, she was a tech reporter and data scientist at Quartz. In a past life, she was also an application engineer at the first startup to spin out of Alphabet's X. She received her BS in mechanical engineering and a minor in energy studies from MIT. Okay, and um, Joaquin serves on the board of directors of uh, the Partnership on AI, a nonprofit a partnership of academic, civil society, industry, and media organizations, creating solutions so that AI advances positive outcomes for people and society, and is a member of the Spanish government's advisory council, council for artificial intelligence. Until September 2021, Joaquin was a dis distinguished technical lead for responsible AI at Facebook, where he led the technical strategy for areas like fairness and inclusiveness, a robustness, privacy, transparency, and accountability. Before this, he built and led an applied ML learning team at Facebook, driving product impact at scale through applied research in machine learning, language understanding, computer vision, computational photography, augmented reality, and other AI disciplines. AML also built the unified AI platform that powers all uh, production applications of AI across the family of Facebook products. Prior to Facebook, he taught a new machine learning course at the University of Cambridge, worked at Microsoft Research, and conducted postdoctoral research at three institutions in Germany, including the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. He received his PhD in 2004 from the Technical University of Denmark. So our session today is going to focus on solutions involving uh, social media recommendation systems, particularly some of the experiences that both Karen and Joaquin have thinking about applications as well as societal impacts. Just reading their bios, I'm sure you all know that we're in for a really amazing discussion. So thank you both Karen and Joaquin for joining us today. I'm really excited to see where this goes. So Karen, I'll pass it over to you to get the conversation rolling. Awesome, thank you so much, Amrita. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you to the Belfer Center for having both of us. Um, just for a little bit of background, uh, Joaquin and I met when I started working on my story about Facebook. Um, Joaquin was the former responsible AI lead there, and we spent quite a lot of time talking together about some of the, the issues that we're going to talk about today. And I was very impressed throughout my time um, speaking with him about his thoughtfulness um, and his really deep caring for these issues. Um, and so I'm, I'm really pleased that we get this public forum to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been talking about um, behind the scenes. So Joaquin, um, obviously there's this huge ongoing debate that's happening today about social media recommender systems. Um, and we're here to tackle that head on today and, and propose some solutions. But I first wanted to give you an opportunity to actually tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you ended up at a place like Facebook. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Hi, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, thank you so much to the, to the Belfer TAP team for, for hosting us. I, I didn't think I would one day work at, at Facebook or work on, on the, at the intersection of machine learning and social media, if, I, if, if I'm honest. I think it happened a little bit like, like many things by, by, by accident through, uh, through connections, uh, through, through good friends who had gone to work at Facebook back in 2011. But one piece of context that I think is really important is that although I was born uh, in Spain and raised in Spain until age three, my parents, uh, my sister and I moved to Morocco when I was three years old. And so I, I grew up in, uh, in the Arab world, uh, surrounded by um, many friends uh, of all kinds of origins, but many friends of, of Muslim and Arabic um, origin. And so when, um, when I visited Facebook in 2012, uh, socially with no, with no idea that I would end up working there, the Arab Spring had been going on for, for about a year. And, and to me, it had caused a very, very profound impression because countries like Egypt or, or Tunisia were seeing uh, massive revolutions in a way. And, and I had close friends living in, in, in these two countries, for example, even my, my sister ended up uh, working in, uh, in, in Tunisia for, for a while. And so, I was blown away by the, the power of tools and platforms like Twitter or, or Facebook to help people communicate, uh, mobilize, and really change society for the, for the better. So it's in that context that I, that I felt uh, compelled to, to, to join Facebook. I thought the mission was simply incredible. Yeah, I, I kind of want to bring people back to that particular time um, in social media because in 2012, it was Facebook was quite young at that time. So could you could you like paint a little bit of a picture of just what stage I guess the company was in, um, and when you came to join the company, what your professional background was at that point, and what you were sort of tasked to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was on a journey as a as a professional background. I was on a journey from almost having been an academic in, in machine learning. I, I was a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Southern Germany doing pretty, pretty theoretical and abstract uh, research. But in the intervening time, I had spent uh, five and a half years at Microsoft Research in Cambridge in the UK initially, um, also doing research, but veering towards applications quite, quite rapidly. And in fact, uh, at Microsoft together with, with some colleagues and, and now very good friends, we um, developed the, uh, the click prediction and ranking algorithms that helped power ads on the Bing search engine. So I had a, I had a bit of background now, not only in the uh, theory and research of machine learning, but also in its application at scale. And in fact, I, I did something considered a bit crazy at the time, which was I, I accepted uh, an offer to uh, leave Microsoft Research and join a product team and become a, an engineering leader. So I had a little bit of experience on, on both sides of the, of the aisle, if you, if you will. So that was a context. And I joined um, Facebook as, as Facebook was a pretty young company. Like you, like you said, it was growing extremely fast. Um, I remember this during 
during the during the first months that I was at Facebook is when uh, we crossed uh, one billion uh, uh, users, and that's not even daily active users or anything like that. It was one billion users total. Um, and a lot of things were in their infancy. You know, um, there was, of course, um, a couple of pretty strong machine learning teams in, in feed ranking, but also in, in, in ads. But when you compare the number of people working in ML uh, at Facebook or at Meta uh, today, you know, to what it was when I joined in, in 2012, you could fit everybody in the, in the room I'm sitting here, you know, who was working on, on ML and I would know them all by, by, by name, right? So I joined in and the, the task that I, was, that I, that I took on uh, was, well, let me build out the uh, machine learning team for, for ads at first. And then very quickly, I, I realized that we needed to invest extremely heavily in uh, platforms, in tools. I used to say, uh, wizards don't scale. We, we need to build a factory. We can't hire enough uh, ML people to do all the work that needs to be done. We really need to take our tools and our platforms to the next level. And to try and make a long story short, that led to the creation of, uh, of the team that Amrita mentioned earlier, the uh, Applied ML team, which then had the scope to uh, help bring ML to everybody across the, across the company. Yeah, so one of the things that when we first started talking about your personal background that I was very touched by was the fact that you that the Arab Spring was was quite personal for you because um, when you when you talk to people in social media, they often reference the Arab Spring, um, but it's it was very different for me hearing it from you because it was something that you were literally sort of seeing in your own life and through your own friends and and your own family. Um, and that was sort of the mission or the vision that you took on when you joined Facebook of this is this is what social media could be. Um, and obviously, to sort of skip a lot of things that happened along the way, social media didn't really quite turn out the way that it was originally envisioned, this, this grandiose ambition um, to connect people, to create these like powerful positive social movements without any of the costs. Um, this past year, there's obviously been a lot of talk now, in particular with Francis Haugen and the Facebook papers that are that are um, re-examining some of the core challenges with social media platforms and why we might be seeing some of the, um, the adverse effects. Um, and Francis Haugen specifically pinpointed a number of the risks to recommender systems. So what are the risks that you see for social media recommender systems in particular as um, someone who more than most people in the world understands how it works and how it was built. Yeah, no, it's interesting. What, what you say is, is exactly right. I, it's, it's been a really interesting journey for me. I, I remember the first few years at, at, at Facebook, my obsession was in, in scaling ML and making sure that we could build bigger and better recommender systems using larger uh, models being able to refresh those models as fast as we can, et cetera, and make them you know, ever, ever, ever more powerful. And it is true that along the way, um, a lot of issues did arise, which I did not anticipate. And I think many people did not um, anticipate. I don't, I, I don't, I don't claim to have a, a comprehensive overview of what the, of what the risks uh, are of, of large scale recommender systems, and in particular, uh, social media recommender systems. But since, uh, since our past conversation and, and your uh, article um, uh, a year ago, I've been, I've been thinking about this a little bit. And so I have maybe four, uh, four buckets of, of concerns that I'd like to propose. And again, disclaimer, th there may be more, and I'm super excited. I know that we have at the Belfer Center uh, people who are thinking about these things uh, very deeply as well. I don't know if Aviv or Badia uh, it has been able to join today, but I'm going to put him on the spot and embarrassing him. I've been reading his work with, with a lot of interest, and I know there's many other people um, as well. So let me let me list out the four buckets, and then we can um, go into them one by one. The, the first one would be uh, mental health uh, concerns. Mm -hmm. The second bucket would be uh, bias and discrimination. And then buckets three and four are similar but different. So mm -hmm. bucket, bucket three would be the, the propagation of, uh, of misinformation in, in particular, but 
um, just of harmful content in, in general. And then bucket four um, builds on this, but is much more specific about on um, personalization. And the fact that if you, if you think about it, everybody has got their own unique personalized feed and, and newspaper. And so the, the risk in bu bucket four is polarization and, and divisiveness. So these are my, my, my four buckets. Shall we? Uh... Yeah, let's, oh. let's go through them one by one. I mean, the mental health one is huge because um, that, was, that was probably the most explosive Facebook paper from the Wall Street Journal was the fact that um, there could be possible that there was research done internally um, at Facebook, at Instagram, showing that there were some adverse effects to mental health um, for teenagers on the platform. And I know that you have three kids yourself and, and you sort of see some of this play out or you have concerns as a parent when you're watching them engage in different social media platforms. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um... Well, to, to make this very personal and down to earth, uh, like you said, I have three kids. Uh, youngest one is almost 12. Uh, middle one is 15 and a half. And our oldest is 19. And one common pattern that I, that I see that does concern me is that um, often you'll see the day uh, pass. And then I'll, I'll sit down and say, well, what happened the last hour or two? And, oh, well, I've just been on, on TikTok or on YouTube or on Instagram or uh, on Snapchat. And I go, okay, well, what, what came out of it? You know, what, what can you remember? It's like, oh, I, I, I don't know. Just like, uh, but two hours have passed, you know, like what, what, what happened there? And so um, I, I am concerned um, about uh, addiction to technology. And I am concerned about <clears throat> that time spent not being, uh, not being valuable. In, in addition to that, of course, there has been um, a lot of research about things like comparison. There have been some really interesting ethical debates about uh, things like whether you should turn uh, beautification uh, filters on by default or not, which I know are not specific to, to an AI um, algorithmic ranking system. But one, one point that I would like to make right now, and you're going to hear me repeat this again and again, is that when we think about these issues, we should not only think about them as an AI issue, we need to think about the end-to-end -end design of the system, right? And so if I'm, if I'm optimizing for engagement or time spent uh, of any kind, um, some of it is going to be achieved through a ranking algorithm that tries to maximize um, some metric that, that relates to engagement, but some of it is also going to be achieved through um, UI user interface decisions, right? Whether it's uh, making it super easy to share stuff or whether it is, you know, to have like um, beautification filters on by, by default and things like that. Yeah, um, why don't we continue going down the rest of your list? So, so the next one, I think you, you spent the most time at Facebook thinking about, this is the bias and discrimination bucket. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, to, to give a little bit of a historical perspective, back in end of 2017 or 2018, I had just spent uh, a good five years plus at, at Facebook. I, I keep saying Facebook because I never worked at Meta. I, I left right before the, the rename. So bear with me on that. Um, I had spent a good five plus years really focused on scaling uh, ML. And then at, at the end of 2017, I, I started to really think about what I should focus on next, right? I, I think of myself very much as a zero to one person. Once, once a team or a platform is, is working, I, I get itchy feet and I, uh, and I, I sort of go uh, look for the next thing. And, and I, I became very uh, attuned uh, again to the... Uh, to the fairness, accountability, and transparency community. Um, in early 2018, there was a first uh, dedicated conference, which was no longer part of the NeurIPS uh, conference. This uh, forum had been a, a workshop of, of NeurIPS in the past. And I thought, okay, I, I really want to devote my next couple of years to responsible AI in general. I found it to be such a vast uh, area, a bit daunting in many ways. And I, I got very drawn, like, like you said, um, to the question of fairness, I have a very funny story. I'll just I'll just drop it, and we don't need to spend time on it. But we can go back to it. It's a it's a little bit like a 
you know, uh, a philosopher and a computer scientist walk into a bar. So literally that happened in, in New York. And I, I had the pleasure to meet um, uh, a philosopher, a moral philosopher who uh, was um, half affiliated with um, industry, half affiliated with academia. And I was so excited because I said, oh, you know what? I figured this out. Um, we're going to build this tool that's going to debias data and models. And then, you know, we're going to make it available to the entire company. And we're going to get rid of bias and discrimination in AI models within like this year. And then the person slowly, slow motion turned their back to me and like didn't talk to me any, anymore in the entire evening. So it was pretty interesting. And of course, the, the reason is that um, fairness is not one of those things that you solve, right? Like, like there is no such thing as like I have solved fairness. And to an engineer like me, with an optimization mindset, and we'll get, I'm, I'm queuing the same for later, we'll talk about the optimization mindset, I hope. That's very hard to grasp, right? Because you're, you're, as an engineer, you think about the world as having states, right? And so something is either solved or is not solved, or it's broken or is not broken. And, mm -hmm. and I got so fascinated about fairness because it's one of these places where there are just many answers and all of them are good. It's just that it's just that the context is going to dictate which one you should choose. Mm -hmm. and, and, even, and even more, it's not even clear who should choose, right? And it's pretty mm -hmm. clear that I shouldn't choose. So anyway, it's such a rich area. But bringing it back to the, to the topic, um, in the context of recommender systems and discovery and suggestions, you can think about concrete examples. You can think about um, building a tool that helps people connect to job opportunities, for example. And then you can think about the bias that exists in, in, in real world data, right? So there are many studies that show, for example, that if you look at a certain um, job opening that has a certain description and some requirements and a certain salary, right? There is a bias by which men tend to apply, even if they have lower qualifications than women for the same job. So if you're not careful and you're trying to learn from the data, your AI might learn that, that it should prioritize males for higher paying jobs, for example, right? Which would, which would be pretty terrible because it would, it would reflect and cement, right? And reinforce biases that exist um, in, in society. Other, other forms of bias that I guess um, have been very much um, discussed uh, are, are biases um, in content moderation. For example, I guess like in, in the US in 2018, there was a lot of uh, discussion around anti-conservative bias. And so that led to a lot of interesting discussions too, right? Which, which is like, okay, well, should you, um, you know, should, should you sort of like suppress a comparable amount of content from conservative versus liberal outlets? Should you instead apply equal treatment and have like procedural consistency where you say, no, this is the bar. And then if one outlet produces more misinformation or violating content, then there will be a bigger chunk of their content removed. And then different people will have different opinions, right? Different people will say, well, I want equal outcomes. Other people will say, well, I want equal treatment. And then, you know, you have to sort of explain where you cannot have both, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then the question is, is, is who decides? There's been a lot of work also in um, computational advertising. There's been some brilliant papers on the ways in which um, algorithms can discriminate. Again, if you're not careful when you're showing people ads, uh, in particular sensitive ads about employment or credit or education and things like that. So anyway, I could go on. Uh, like you said, uh, fairness is the area that I spent a ton of time thinking about. Uh, and maybe we need a dedicated session to talk about, about that. In, <laughs> I in, think we do. In depth, yeah. Yeah, I think we do. But we'll move along to the the, the last two. And I I'm, I think um, I'm I'm going to put them together because they they are they are very interrelated. And um, these are two of my for me the, the the questions that I sort of obsess with is like how do recommender systems end up propagating uh, misinformation, harmful content, um, or polarize people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, let me, um, th they, are, they are interrelated, I agree with you. I'll, I'll still try to break it down as like two, two sub bullet points or something like that, if you will. Um, in, a, in, a, in a very naive way, imagine that you uh, were to build 
an algorithmic recommendation system for social media. Now take a moment to think about how you would do that. The first thing that you need to do is you need to figure out, well, I need to train my algorithm. I need to ask it. I need to give it a goal. Mm. So what's that goal going to be? Well, one goal could be, I want people to be engaged because if they're engaged, that's a good thing. Well, what does it mean to be engaged? Well, it can mean I click on stuff or, or I like it, or I emit any of the reactions. Different platforms allow for different type of reactions. Figure it out. Maybe you give a, 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 a bigger weight to a love reaction and a, and a, and a sl smaller weight to a sad reaction. And there's many ways to, to, to calibrate these things, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe comments matter, right? Because you feel like, oh, if actually if people actually take the time to comment, then that means that they're engaged. So let's, let's focus on comments for a second, right? If you go ahead and maximize comments, then um, on, on, on the positive side, you might see more content that you care about and you react to. So you might see, I don't know, a friend who got married and you might have missed it, right? If, if the ranking system hadn't caught it and that's good, right? Or uh, because I'm balanced, I, I, I try to be balanced. Uh, another positive example, you know, I'm super excited about my, my uh, guitar teacher, uh, James Robinson. Hey, James, um, I don't know if you're, if you're listening, probably not. Um, my, my guitar teacher, like many creators, um, builds their, their, their livelihood by, by trying to reach the relevant audience on, on social media, not only, not only Facebook, but, but many others, right? On, on the flip side, you can sort of see that if, I'm, if I am uh, either a bad actor or you know, I'm trying to game the system, I'm going to call out uh, Aviv one more time. I don't know if he's, if he's there, but he, he, he makes this very clear statement, which is that the way we design our recommender system actually defines the rules of the game, right? If you sit down to play Risk or Monopoly or Settlers of Catan or whatever game you like playing, there are some rules and you know uh, that those rules are going to incentivize a certain behavior, right? If I know, if I figure out that comments are rewarded, I'll be tempted to write inflammatory content, you know? Maybe, maybe something um, that will trigger strong reactions. And I get like a ton of comments, right? And then it's almost like the, I don't know how to pronounce it, the so Euroboros uh, serpent that eats its own tail, right? Like you get, you get this sort of a self reinforcing thing uh, uh, loop, what uh, Chip uh, Huyen, who is uh, an incredible um, ML researcher, by the way, uh, has been talking about, she calls this uh, degenerate feedback loops, right? Where you... Mm -hmm. You, you, people get then shown more of that content and less of other things, right? And then you get, people also act by imitation a little bit, right? If you see more of that, you might be tempted to create more of that content, right? Well, until everybody leaves the platform, which is, which is sort of one um, mode of failure. So there is a danger that optimizing for engagement will, one, incentivize people to create content that is inflammatory in, in many ways. Um, but, but also the problem is that you get this winner take all um, uh, phenomenon where some of that content can, as you were saying, go, go viral and, and, and dominate. And one, one thought that I wanted to plant here, I know that I might be jumping ahead a little bit because uh, I, I know we want to talk about solutions, but you can think that you can police these things after the fact. You can think, well, this is not a problem with the recommender system itself. It's, 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 it's just like bad behavior. And then we'll add, you know, some um, integrity or trust or health. Different companies call this differently, but it's policing. Afterwards, I, I, think, I think, of course, you should do that. But I think the more you can front load incentivizing the right behaviors, um, the better. So mm -hmm. now the, the second sub-bullet point, uh, which is polarization. Well, one of the key challenges here is that um, the, the recommender systems are highly personalized, right? And so, um, and that again can be a good thing that helps James, my guitar teacher, read the right, the, reach the right audience. So that's awesome when it, when it works. But it also means that you get phenomena like um, what Guillaume Chasselot um, has studied, which is um, how if you create a, a blank YouTube profile and, and you start clicking on the next uh, uh, suggested video and, and you start to sort of go a little bit more towards either liberal or conservative content, it kind of tends to tend a little bit to the extremes and, and going away from the, from the center. So one of the things that 
is also heavily being being studied is this idea of the the disappearing common ground right mm -hmm. and and this is interesting because people people have been talking about this before social media people have talked about this already with the emergence of cable tv where uh, you know, once you have hundreds of channels, it's easier to sort of live in your own little silo and only see your own media. And then if you sit down with other people, you might not have ever watched any piece of news in common, right? So it's, it's difficult to have any kind of civic engagement um, uh, in, in, that, in, in that context. So there is a risk as well that, that people get polarized or even radicalized um, People are, there are some articles that study uh, preference amplification, which is kind of interesting, which is, which is this idea that, that there is actually an interaction between the recommender system and, and, and the human being, right? So I might come in with a certain set of beliefs, but then through prolonged exposure, even if, even if and this is very important, even if no individual piece of content violates any community standards or policies, right? If I'm only exposed to a certain type of content, right? Over time, I can become radicalized and I can become polarized. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to I'd like to mention I'd like to cite some work that is not from the AI community uh, from architecture. There is a, a brilliant architect called Laura Kurgan at Columbia, who has been writing beautiful articles on the analogy between urban planning and the design of social media recommender systems. So where's the connection? The connection is this. The connection is whether neighborhoods are heterogeneous or homogeneous in the cost and size of housing and so on. And what are the factors that increase or decrease homophily? And so homophily is a mechanism by which you will feel even more connected to people who are similar to yourself by any by by specific demographics this could be obviously income education but it can also be perceived race or or others right and so in in her work she shows that um, well she, she references a lot of work a lot of studies over, over the years that in connection um, to to civil rights for example that showed that um, um, more mixed neighborhoods ended up resulting in people being less racist, right? And so I, I find her work very, uh, very interesting because it, it it points to this idea, right? Like um, uh, this question of, of of how do we inject diversity in, into recommender systems? Is is that even possible, right? I think it's very hard, and and we should probably talk about that in in a bit. Yeah, I think. Um... I, I really love that example, by the way, the, the, the urban planning. Um, and someone asked in the chat who that was, and it's it's Laura Kurgan. Yeah. Um, so I'll just type that in the chat. But so we we sort of talked about these four different buckets of of risks that are coming out of recommender systems um, as you see them. And I want to start jumping to the solutions, um, seeing the time that we have right now. We obviously like you've talked, you've touched both on the benefits and promise of recommender systems and the risks. So obviously it, it's sort of like, we can't really just throw the recommender systems out. That's not necessarily the solution that I think um, we should be spending time talking about. So like, what, what are the possible solutions that we should be thinking about? Like what could, um, let's start with what could companies be doing differently? What could people within companies actually be studying or, um, or what could different teams be be outputting to actually facilitate um, better public understanding or or um, actually change the way that recommender systems work as they do today? Yeah, I think I again another disclaimer. I, I don't I don't have the solutions, but um, maybe there's four, and this is a coincidence, the fact that it's four um, four, four thoughts here in in, in no particular um, order. Because many of these phenomena are so new, I think um, voluntary transparency uh, and, and accountability as well, but let's just begin with transparency, I think is extremely important, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, um, what could this look like in practice? Uh, this could look like uh, voluntary daily reports or public dashboards that show you 
um, what content is going viral where uh, across the world, right? And if you think about it, in most uh, platforms, whether it's again like YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and so on, stuff stuff that goes viral is 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 uh, by definition um, public. It's not it's not a, a private message from me to you, right? Like that'd be a problem if that mm-hmm. if that went viral, right? Um, yeah. And so. Um, I think the privacy concerns can be addressed in, in that context, and I think the value to society would be tremendous. Right? It's almost like uh, it's almost like you, uh, at a certain level of uh, of distribution and size and impact on the world, you're almost like a public utility, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and you almost owe it to society to report back how things are going, right? And yeah. and so what one would be to report on on what's going viral where, but also and, and it would be difficult to implement, but I think it's worth trying. Also, segment the population in different in different ways by by mm-hmm. um, age, socioeconomic status, uh, language, uh, region, other attributes, and try to also report you know what kind of content is are, are different groups exposed to and how heterogeneous versus mm-hmm. versus homogeneous that that content uh, that that content is right. We won't have time to talk about um, something I've talked about in public in the past a lot, which was the, the 2019 India elections and some fairness concerns there, but, you know, there, for example, region and language in India are two very clear, um, indicators that correlate with other things like religion and caste. And you would want to know what are people seeing, especially if, if there's harmful content, um, going about. So that's the first one, right? Like, uh, I think, uh, transparency, Th- there are some good examples, uh, uh, Facebook slash meta publishes this, um, Community standards enforcement reports, which are public. If you Google that, you'll you'll sort of see the latest one. I think it's a good step. It sort of shows, hey, what harmful content you know is going on. It's not a real time dashboard. It doesn't get into the specifics. You don't get to see you know what exactly is going on. Uh, I think we need a, a lot more um, of that. So that's that's one. I actually I w- I want to briefly follow up on that. I mean, one of the things that Facebook has been criticized for. Um, is the fact that it sort of games its metrics on those reports and the real-time dashboards that we do have available, which is through the CrowdTangle tool, um, is something that Facebook has deprioritized and underfunded and um, started shutting down. And there, there have been other examples of, you know, um, data that used to be available to researchers that was meant for transparency that ha- it's now been revealed that Facebook is either denying access to these researchers or it's giving them um, incomplete data. So how do we actually, I agree with you that that's a great idea. How do we make Facebook do it properly? <laughs> like like who, who are the people involved that should be holding Facebook accountable to transparency standards? Yeah, um, F- Facebook and and everyone else, <laughs> I would say. Um, mm. uh, I- I'd love to see I'd love to see TikTok do this. I'd love to see um, um, YouTube. Um, everybody. Mm-hmm. My my intuition is that um, there will have to be uh, regulatory pressure for this, um, which is uh, which is maybe the. Uh, the, the second bucket here, right, is is accountability mechanisms or accountability infrastructure. I am not an expert in um, freedom of speech. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and uh, especially in the U.S. and especially coming from Europe, where the perspective is a bit different, and especially now that I have um, I have close friends who have gone back to to China, and we we talk about the the cultural differences. And, and the, again, it's it's like fairness. There's no right answer, right, to freedom of speech. But when you look at the uh, at Section 230 of the uh, Communications Decency Act, I think it's I think it's reasonable to ask oneself: Well, in what circumstances does it make sense to 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 uphold that? And in what other circumstances should we be actually asking um, for more um, um, accountability and for an obligation to actually report on on what's going on? So that mm-hmm. would be the the, the second um, um, yeah the, the second thing. Yeah. Um, you've also talked to me about this idea of having participatory governance, this idea that, that it is rather concerning to ask platforms themselves to be deciding some of the things that we sort of sometimes impose, uh, responsibility or burden on them to decide. So could you talk a little bit about what participatory governance is and how you could see that actually functioning in practice, given that, you know, Facebook already has an external oversight board, but it's not necessarily working the way that um, it was originally envisioned. 
Well, I, I, um, I don't know whether the external oversight board is working or not the way it was um, originally envisioned. For me, I, I view it as a very good proof of concept that may not scale, that, that may not satisfy mm -hmm. the it, it may not go as far as, as we need it to be. But let, let me just give an example. So in May 2020, um, back then, uh, President Trump um, wrote both on Twitter and on Facebook and uh, probably in other places too, uh, a tweet along the lines that, that contained this statement, uh, when the looting starts, the, the shooting starts, right? And not only Facebook, but you know, most media had intense debates on like, okay, can you like, what do we do? Like, we do we keep this up or do we take it down, right? Um, and, and at the time, the external oversight board was not operational, and I remember that it was extremely painful because um, I, I was dying for it to be there and to sort of say, hey, here you go, here's a here's a, an interesting and extremely difficult example where um, Facebook should not be making the decision on whether that content should be up on the site or not. And, and I say the site, it's an app, it's a platform. Um, and another example would be right after the Capitol riots, um, again, the, the same, um, I guess, I don't know whether he was formerly former president or not, but, but sort of said things like, uh, you know, we love you, you're very special, great patriots and so on, you know, talking to the, to the rioters. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, that was like the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? In a way, like then then um, Facebook essentially indefinitely suspended um, uh, Trump at, at the time. And then the I think the fascinating thing is that then then Facebook still did what I think is the right thing and, and sort of went to the external oversight board once it was stood up, right? In, in uh, 2021 and said, hey, this is what we decided and here's the data. Uh, did we do the right thing? And uh, the, the way the external oversight board came back was really interesting. They said, well... Uh, yes and no. Um, um, yes, that content was unacceptable and should be taken down. Uh, <clears throat> but no, you cannot indefinitely suspend anyone because you haven't defined what that means and in what conditions you would do that, right? So you gotta you gotta clean up your rules, right? So I think mm -hmm. what was really interesting is that the external oversight board provided feedback in two different ways. One was very specific, right, on a piece of content and a behavior, but the other one was feedback even about the governance itself, right, saying like, hey, improve your rules. And I think that is awesome, right? And, and so I think we need to see a, a, a lot of that, but what I don't know, and uh, I'll, I'll, another, another sort of a, a, a plug here is for uh, Gillian Hatfield, who's a, an amazing researcher in uh, Toronto. Um, she's been working a lot on... Um, regulatory marketplaces and, and this idea that we need to uh, we need to find other ways to create uh, uh, regulation because the, the old ways are, are too slow. And the, the reason I'm interested, the angle that fascinates me is the one of like, how do we bring democracy into the process of, uh, of, of, of deciding the, the rules that, that we big tech companies uh, need, need to create in order to, to operate? Yeah, that was, that was three. So I have one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to interject right before you get to that last one and just remind people that if you have questions for the Q&A portion, you can put it in through the Q&A feature um, on Zoom. And I see that there's already one question in, so I'll get to that shortly. But if other people want to want to pop that in while Joaquin talks about the third one, um, before, I can start before. getting yeah, to yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to have a prop and I didn't get organized. Um, my, my prop is a book. And the book is called System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How to Reboot by three phenomenal authors. They teach the CS182 course at Stanford uh, called uh, um, Ethics, Public Policy and Techno Technological Change. I think I might misremember. But the important thing is that uh, Rob Reich is actually a philosopher. Uh, Mehran Sahami is a computer scientist and uh, Jeremy Weinstein is a political scientist. And the, the reason I'm bringing this as, a, as, a, as an example is um, that book talks about the dangers of the optimization mindset, which is, hey, the mindset I grew up with, I'm an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. I like to optimize things. And, and, and the problem there is that you, you might incur failures of imagination. And one of the things that has been very painful for me 
in my last years at Facebook was people would tell me, why are you working at Facebook? It's an evil company. And I would, I would just not understand because that's not the reality I was living on the ground. I'm like, listen, I can give you countless examples where we've done risk assessments and have not shipped something because it wasn't ready. And, and zooming out, when you think about what might be happening is, 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 is less about anyone being evil. And it's more about systemic issues where almost like the culture and the approach of things is just not diverse enough. Like, mm -hmm. like you, you can't only have engineers making the most consequential decisions. You need the Rob Reich philosophers and you need the Jeremy Weinstein political scientists and, and you need diversity across not only uh, uh, you know, uh, your education and background, you, you, need a, you, need to take, you need to really sort of embrace diversity and inclusion and make it count. You need to give it teeth. This is, this is something that we've talked about a lot, that this like system optimization mindset and how, um, because I was also trained as an engineer and how I sort of went through a similar journey of starting to realize the gaps in that. And, and one of my favorite quotes is like, engineering is all about the how and humanities is all about the why. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason why you need interdisciplinary teams to, to talk about these issues because you need to, you need to figure out whether or not um, the question you're even asking or the problem you've scoped is even the right problem. Um, we have a bunch of questions that are starting to come in. So I'm, I'm gonna start taking some of them um, and then I'll, I'll I, I have a couple other questions as well that I'm gonna try to weave in. But the first question from Hamid is um, recent events in Ottawa. So this is referring to the trucker convoys. Um, and elsewhere have shown that extremism has found its way into the virtual world. Given the recent revelations about Cambridge Analytica, in what way could democratic societies protect citizens and their democratic systems? Will it be through more public oversight and regulations of the algorithms and or metrics or better enforcement of corporate tax systems, et cetera? I think it's, uh, it's all of the above. I don't think that I have one single, um, um, answer to this um maybe i'll maybe i'll bring up so i, I think a lot of what we've discussed already uh, addresses the, the the question like the four the four buckets of, of solution that i that i mentioned are the ones that come to my mind there's one more that i just thought about mm -hmm. in, in the same way as sometimes we have a public health education campaigns that say you know wash your hands because because if you do then you'll kill germs and i think um uh, Oh, my memory is, is uh, oh, damn. There's another, another uh, Belfer fellow uh, who used to be chief technology advisor to Obama. Damn it. You know who he is. Ah, oh, it'll come back to me. I, I think uh, Patel, yeah, he, he, he used to uh, uh, um, talk a lot about the, the example of uh, the, the impact of uh, people starting to wash hands in, in hospitals and so on, right? Like in, in, in the medical profession, believe it or not, there was a time where doctors and nurses wouldn't wash hands. And so I, I think that we need to invest a lot in the, in the public understanding of, of social media and educating people. Just, just to bring in a bit of optimism here in the, in the middle of this very stern conversation, I am actually encouraged sometimes, the, the flip side of my kids spending so much time on, on social media is that we have this amazing breakfast conversations and and also it's amazing to see them educate their grandparents on like hey grandma you know in german to my to, to their german grandma or abuela to the spanish one or abuelo you know the grandpas like by default you shouldn't believe what you see if people share something on whatsapp with you by default don't believe it it's like spam and they're like why why, why pe would people do that and then you know my kids kind of like ex explain it to them so i think I think I'm hopeful that that at least in in some of the younger generations, people are developing some sort of an immune system of, of sorts. But again, mm -hmm. like I'm an optimist. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think investing very heavily in, in in public education, in addition to all of the regulatory steps, transparency, accountability, and participatory governance, I think is necessary. Will it be sufficient? I don't know. Um, there's another question here. It's it's a pretty hard one. <laughs> so it says, this is from Derek. It says, um, you point out the, face, the Facebook oversight board model of accountability doesn't scale well. So are there accountability models that you think do have the potential to operate at scale? I, um, 
I don't know. I, I came across um, papers on, I think it was called fluid democracy or, or something like that, which to my computer scientist brain uh, translate into a tree and, and trees can be efficient uh, constructions, right? Where um, you, you could imagine, uh, well, g going back to social structures that through the centuries have ensured uh, that social norms sort of prevail, right? Like you, you have maybe the elders in the village and then the elders in the county and then the elders in the region and, and, and whatnot. And so the, the problems you need to solve are not just uh, participatory governance in general. It has to be localized and in context, right? I was saying earlier that freedom of speech means something very different in, in China, in the US and in Germany and in Spain, right? Um, yeah. And there's no right or wrong, but you need to localize it, right? So the, the question is, it's again like do we need to sort of reinvent democracy in, in, in a certain way, uh, make it very fluid and figure out how do people elect their, you know, representatives that will actually make those decisions. Um, I'm going to ask you a question before I move on to more audience questions. So one of the things that um, you invested a lot of energy in at the end of your time at Facebook was diversity and inclusion. Um, and that's sort of part of, I think it folds very much into this conversation of finding solutions and how companies need to uh, shore things up internally to actually tackle some of these issues head on. So why why was that important to you and, and how do you see that fitting into this conversation that we're having? At uh, New Rips 2019, so for, for those of you who don't know, New Rips is um, one of the main uh, machine learning and AI conferences. I've attended, I think, all of them since the year 2000. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cello player, was invited to a workshop. He came, we chatted, and then I, I was lucky. We bumped into each other. I, I had a, a few minutes to, to talk with him, which was incredible, one-on-one. -on -one. And I told him I was working, I was starting to work on responsible AI. I was trying to understand how do you help people trust AI? So I asked him that question. I said, well, how, what would make you trust AI, Yo-Yo? And he said, well, the most important thing is I need to understand who is behind the AI. Who built it? What are their motivations, their concerns? Who are they? What are their lived experiences? Mm. And I thought, okay, <laughs> it's not looking super good because <laughs> it's a bunch of people like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and of course, the, every, every, every company has been talking a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, BNI, inclusion and diversity, you know, the order and the acronyms change and so on. And I, I think I was frustrated by the fact that it was a lot of talk, but I wasn't seeing the results. And so I, I decided to dive in and try to understand, well, systemically, what is going on? And I, I, I realized that the problem is that I, I didn't think leaders were being held accountable for creating an inclusive culture or for, mm -hmm. or for evolving uh, recruiting to really create equal opportunity. Although I, I need to emphasize the most important piece in diversity and inclusion, in my opinion, is actually the inclusion part. It's actually what happens with the people who are on the team now. You don't, you don't address diversity and inclusion by hiring uh, a black female into your team or by hiring um, uh, an Asian transgender person into your team or, or a veteran or whatever it is. That's, that's great if that means that you have a consistent process that gives equal opportunity to everybody and these people were great, super. That's really good. But if you don't really have... Uh, an environment where everybody can contribute equally, right? And where decision processes aren't dominated by a small minority, then you have achieved nothing. And so we, uh, <laughs> I like to work on hard things, um, you know, teamed up with HR, with legal and said, well, how do we change our performance review system so that how much we pay people, whether we promote them or not, and so on, actually depends on very clear and concrete expectations. So I won't, again, we need another session for this to go into the details, but um, we did this, we, we shipped it, and um, I, I feel very uh, happy about that step. That doesn't solve the problem, but I think creating hard accountability, right, and making what people get paid depend on clear diversity and inclusion expectations is essential. And then people sometimes say, well, but how does this help the business? Um, look, it's very simple. 
I think you make bu better business decisions by having a much more diverse and inclusive um, uh, task force. And you can anticipate problems that you didn't see, right? And going back to some of the things that we discussed earlier, and maybe the, the Ottawa question, I, I think that I think that technology companies need to have philosophers, moral philosophers, ethicists, uh, political scientists in the leadership team at the very top, and that they need to be put in roles that have teeth uh, on, a, on an even level uh, with, uh, with engineering. And obviously, those are functions and disciplines. I think that, that diversity and inclusion needs to sort of extend beyond, beyond that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one of the, the things that we've talked about before is that this, the side effect of bringing more diverse uh, lived experience is that you also get more diverse expertise experience or whatever you want to call it, the, the expertise. Um, because a lot of the people who are from more marginalized backgrounds that don't typically appear in these types of roles are actually in the other disciplines. <laughs> and they're like, it's because they're, for whatever reason, um, they're pushed away from tech into the, perhaps a social science or into, from AI, uh, into AI ethics. Um, and so there, there's like a really complementary effect that happens when you, when you bring, when you, when you open up, uh, the table, I guess, to all, all of these different perspectives. But I'm, so I'm actually really curious because we've, we've never talked about this is like, what actually happened once you implemented this at Facebook? Like, have you seen noticeable differences yet? Or do you think they're still to come? I think they're, I think they're still to come. These things take a take a long time. What, what I can say is that the level of awareness increased dramatically, right? Um, and, uh, and people, people would actually discuss systematically um, diversity, equity, and inclusion during performance reviews, which is something that um, happens at least twice a year. And I say at least because you have the big ones and the small ones and the informal ones. And you know, if you're a manager, you spend your time doing performance reviews when, in one shape or, or the other. Um, ma making something be top of mind, I think, is, is a crucial first step. And I think, and, and that did happen. There were a lot of pretty awesome improvements to recruiting processes, which were already pretty good. And I also saw a lot of, um, I saw a, a change towards really acknowledging and rewarding people who were investing in, in, in building community. And you, you and I have talked about this uh, in some of our conversations, this, uh, th this triple whammy of sorts, right? Where I would be, I would be in meetings working um, on um, diversity and inclusion and in incorporating that into performance review. And I'd look and I'd realize that the, I was the only white male in the, in the meeting. Um, and so everyone else was donating some of their time, right, to work on something that might not even be rewarded, right? So first of all, working on something that is an opportunity cost. You could be working on something you know is rewarded, right? Um, second, uh, well, this work you're doing doesn't get rewarded. And third, you might even be perceived to be annoying, right? Like a, like a fly in the ointment or something like that, right? And, and sort of say like, listen, you're annoying. Like, can you get away, right? Like we, we have uh, some business goals here, right? To, to, to achieve. Um, I lost, yeah. my, I lost my train of thought, which, which is... Which <laughs> yeah, is... <laughs> well, no, I mean, the, the, the thing that I love about, um, the thing that I love about the, this particular anecdote that you're talking about, or, or these reflections, is the fact that it, specifically that you decided to take on that triple whammy as a white man, because typically the reason why um, women or people of color are the ones that take up the triple whammy is because for them, it's an existential thing. Like they have to do it. Otherwise they're not gonna survive at the organization if it doesn't get better on certain fronts or they're not gonna progress in their career if these things don't get better. But for someone where it's not an existential crisis to actually put their weight behind that um, and lend that, I, I think that's, um, yeah, it's really incredible. And it's, it's a very good demonstration of how to be a good ally in, in those situations. Um, we've, we've spent 
most of this time talking about like what companies can do, I do want to just briefly touch on what are some of the things that people who are not inside of these companies can do, whether that's civil society or the press or regulators. Um, we, we already touched on some of the things that you think regulators can do. Um, but like, what, what are some of the things that should be happening outside of companies very explicitly to help us push and tackle these, these problems around social media recommender systems? Yeah, a couple, a couple of thoughts. Um, let, let me start with, uh, with the job seekers, right? We, we are seeing um, a pretty dramatic revolution, I would say, in the, in the labor market, where uh, I guess people talk about the great resignation, others talk about the great reshuffle. People are choosing to leave their current job and, and thinking about where, where they want to go. Well, one of the one of the first things to do is uh, inquire about the values and principles of the of the company you're you're going to right. Like job seekers have more leverage now than probably ever in in, in history, right? So I think this is a great time uh, to do this, and and it's working, right? I LinkedIn published this really interesting study, which is within twelve months, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm misquoting the numbers, but they approximately go like this. Within 12 months, we've gone from uh, one in 67 uh, uh, jobs offered uh, a hybrid employment where you could work from home um, some part of it to one in six, right? That's crazy. It, it works, right? So ma markets are markets are very uh, um, powerful for sure. Speaking of markets, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, you know, I, I guess another one is. Um, to further encourage competition, right? There's, a, there's something we'll have to talk about some other day, but I'll just plant it here in case people want to look it up. And, and, and probably most, most people at the Belfer Center uh, will, will know about this work. Um, Stephen Wolfram proposed this idea of, of saying, hey, listen, maybe we should uh, force um, companies to open up to, to a market of uh, ranking providers, right? Where where maybe you could have, and, and by the way, the engineering design of this would be extremely difficult, right? And there's like a lot of privacy concerns, but bear with me for a second. Um, I, I know Twitter is pretty excited about this. I've been taught, I have good friends there who, uh, who've been vocal about, about this, right? So where you could almost have like an API or, or a way to plug in your own uh, ranking provider. And, and again, right, like I could, uh, I don't know, like, I love the outdoors. Maybe there's even like the REI ranking provider. I'm kidding, but but you know you could you could choose like uh, the Fox News ranking provider, the uh, NPR ranking provider, right? Like I don't know. I, I listen to to German radio, Deutsche Welle ranking provider, whatever it might be, right? So mm -hmm. I think I think competition and marketplaces could play a a, a big um, um, a, a big role here. But there's probably more ideas. Um, maybe I'll throw one more, which is. Let's have more uh, courses like CS182 in, in Stanford. And I know with, with all respect, I know there's, there's the equivalent in most uh, uh, schools these days where you see philosophy, political science and technology converge mm. and really create a forum where we, we just reimagine how society should function um, and CS 182 is there, it's their um, ethics and computer science class? Yeah, that's the ethics, public policy, and, uh, uh, and technological um, evolution. I, I don't want to get the rail and, and start typing. It's almost that, uh, the title. I, I... Yeah. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a good segue into to this last question because you were talking about um, some studies on just the future of work. And, and we started on a personal note about how you. Um, made your way to Facebook. So I just wanted to end on a personal note of where you're going to head next because you've left Facebook. Um, and you recently went on your own journey to figure out what you want to do, um, continuing to work sort of in this in this responsible technology space. So what was the process that you went through and, and tell us where you've landed? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I've just joined LinkedIn as it happens. <laughs> so, and uh, this was a and I'm super excited. At LinkedIn, I'm going to be a technical fellow focused on, on AI. But what really excited me was, on one hand, the mission of the, of the company. I think that the potential to do good for people and for society is, is tremendous, whether by giving feedback to governments and academic institutions and like, hey, there's a mismatch between the skills you're offering and, and, what, and what 
and what jobs require, right? But also by really focusing on, on what the values, the, the values of LinkedIn really won me over, the focus on equity and on putting people first and, and really, really doing the utmost to give equal opportunity to, um, to people. This was not an easy path. I left Facebook in early September. I thought I was gonna take a bunch of time off. I was, thought I was gonna be super happy. One important piece of context is my wife uh, stopped working 15 years ago when our second child was born and she's gone back to studying and she's studying full time. So when I left in September, for me, things were easy because I'm like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm gonna be a stay at home dad. That's the single most important thing that I can do right now. And then I went through an excruciatingly painful identity crisis. Like I, I, there was this time where I was filling forms and I didn't realize how much a person's identity is tied to their professional career. It was like employment. I'm like unemployed, stay at home dad, homemaker. I raise chickens. I don't know. Like I, I true story. I, I have, I have chickens in my garden. Um, and now more, more seriously, um, after talking a lot with my with my wife and actually learning in practice, um, actually taking a bunch of the workload of the of the house to the point where now my my wife sometimes goes like, "Oh my god, the piano! We haven't paid the piano in two months." I'm like, "I got it. I've been I've been I've been paying I've been paying the piano teacher all this time." Oh, did you reschedule for president? Say, "Yep, done. Don't worry about it." <laughs> so I've I've learned new things. Um, we we sort of reached this conclusion that that maybe we could find a balanced approach where I would work uh, part-time and with a lot of flexibility. And, and LinkedIn is really leading the way here with a, with a hybrid work model. There's no, there's no set rules on how many days and hours you need to be in the office. Although I'm very lucky that the office is actually within cycling distance uh, from, from my place. So that's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to work on, on a mission that I think is super important uh, to try and, uh, bring some of the things I've learned um, and yeah, and to try to make, you know, this world a little bit of a, of a better place. I just have one last question, um, but we're almost out of time. So, so I'm just going to give you a minute to respond. What is, what's like your, your one sentence recommendation to other technologists um, that are, that really, really are struggling to figure out what pathway they should carve out for themselves if they want to work on responsible technologies. Well, if I, if I could do everything over again, I would have taken um, more political science and, and moral philosophy courses hmm. just to learn that there exists a different way of thinking than the engineering way. <laughs> <laughs> a, way of, a way of thinking that focuses, to your point earlier, that focuses actually yeah. on asking good questions yeah, and not only on, on answering and solving things. And I think you need both to be successful. Yeah. I think that's a great note to end on. I'm going to pass it back to Amrita. Thank you so much, Joaquin, for joining me this in this great. conversation. And thank you to everyone for, for coming to listen. All right. Okay. Thanks so much, Karen and Joaquin. Um, just, I got so much out of your conversation together as well. And I think something that really came out was that when we think about solutions, there are two key components. One is the step process. So who decides how the game is played? who codifies those standards in our ecosystem and then who gives it teeth? Joaquin, I think you said that. I, I think that's a great way to think about how we think about impl implementation and effectiveness in terms of mitigating some of the risks and harms that we talk so much about, but we're really struggling to put our hands around. And so I, I think that was really great. And again, of course, it's a multi-stakeholder approach. Karen, I really appreciated, appreciated you asking, how do we think about civil society policymakers folks at different companies as this ecosystem, again, to think about how we're gonna move forward. So Karen and Joaquin, thank you again so much. I know you both alluded to another session. We'd love to host you guys for another session to really dive into more of these concrete solutions that'll pave the way forward. Um, but with that in mind, thanks again, everybody for joining. Again, this is the first of many sessions where we'll talk about solutions across various topics. Um, digital platforms, biotechnology, et cetera. So we really encourage you to 
follow us on Twitter um, or sign up for a newsletter to make sure that you uh, get notified and for any upcoming sessions. But thanks again for such a great session. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day.